Zimmy, and um, Amanda, thank you. <laughs> thank you um, for inviting me and hosting me this past week. Um, I'm going to take a moment. I don't know if anyone got to see the book that was compiled uh, for the show. Um, but yeah, so there's a book um, of work that I've done over the past nine years, but that book was dedicated to a dear friend named Lavera Crawley, who came with her family from Oakland. So I just want to give them a shout out and thank you for coming up. <laughs> um, and just, um, I don't unfortunately know the tribes that were here previously, but I just want to take a moment and acknowledge the uh, indigenous ancestors. Um, and then, these people beside me are friends I've made over the years. Um, Jesse Haslip. Um, I became aware of Jesse's work in 2011. We were both invited by 350.org to submit work for a street art project on carbon emissions. And um, he did work that I thought was just amazing. And um, I fell in love with his work then. And just this past year, I had an opportunity to be in a show with him um, in Colorado Springs. And then I do a project on the reservation where I invite artists out to paint murals on roadside stands. And Jesse was one of the artists who came out and uh, gave the reservation some serious love. And um, yeah, so he agreed to take part in this show by doing some text on these pieces. So, And then Thea. <laughs> Thea Gar is from this area. She's from Portland. Um, I was really fortunate in 2014 in that I was invited to join a, join a group of um, printmakers, primarily, with a focus on social justice and environmental justice, whose work I've been aware of for a while. And it was it's still an honor to be a part of that group. It's called Just Seeds. But Thea is one of the, are you one of the, Founding one of the original. Not the <laughs> All right, yeah. yeah. So she's a printmaker, and we've done a lot of projects together. Um, and it's just been an interesting thing, you know, working kind of outside my discipl discipline, sharing ideas and energy with um, with these artists. So we just thought we would talk about that. So. <laughs> um, you want to? Oh, <laughs> put you on the spot. Yeah. Why do I gotta go first? So we're talking about collaboration. Yeah. So I was thinking about this a lot the last few days. Um, I come from the graffiti art world, and within the graffiti realm, there's graffiti crews. And so I grew up collaborating with my little vandal buddies because we would we would conspire to go do what we called productions, and most of it was like in the middle of the night, like under a bridge or on the freeway. But we would like come up with like color schemes, like we would each get the same colors and we'd have the same like fill in and outline. And then like it evolved over the years um, into like legal walls and into murals. And so like I've grown pretty much throughout my whole art career or whatever. I don't, I don't know what. It, my life, I've been collaborating with other artists, and it's crazy because I was always told that it would get me nowhere because I was doing graffiti, <laughs> and um, that it evolved into this, and doing it with amazing um, activists that I admire. One of the stories Jesse told earlier in the week was, um, or I don't know when you said this, but uh, he said that Blue Sky is particularly particular gallery is one of his favorite, or perhaps the favorite? Your, yeah, your favorite art space in Portland. Yeah, and um, he knew that as a painter, he wouldn't be able to get into the space. And I didn't know that <laughs> when I invited him, so it just worked out very nicely. Yeah. That was yeah. very, I got in here. <laughs> uh, I figured it out. Got to know the right people. Yeah, <laughs> it's all about who you know. Uh, um, and so yeah, I I continue to collaborate um, throughout. I don't really like the word career because it's way more than that to me. But it's like my life and 
I look forward to collaborating because I feel like um, so much new concept and ideas are born from the, the combination of, of art. Like I just was collaborating, and that's why you're all waiting for so long. <laughs> but um, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It, it forces you into spaces that you wouldn't normally be in and into to new mindsets and critique and just all the beautiful things of, of the art form. So I, I have a question for you. I have a question for both of you. Uh, because you both do work independently, yet you work with other people. Um, how do you let go? <laughs> you know, what is your process for collaborating? Do you agree beforehand, work within this scope, or does it just evolve or, or, or organically? Um. Well, back to graffiti, I, letting go, I, I learned very young to just say goodbye to my work. Like, right when I was finished, I never knew if I would see it again because it would probably be painted over yeah. the next day. So that really taught me how to let go and to the, how temporary things can be and not to get too invested. And so co collaboration is, is not hard for me because I'm so used to just saying goodbye and letting the elements get to it. And I think I've always been fascinated by it because it's, you know, like a an, no an, an radical concept in this culture that we grew up in, you know, to, to actually not be so individualistic in your, in your thinking and being. And that's never been natural to me to be individualistic in particular. But this idea of like being autonomous, meaning like you're kind of your best, most crazy self, but that, but that you can only be that in a context, like within a group, you know? That the two, that interdependence and autonomy are one and the same thing. And I think that that's like a really interesting idea that you, that you can talk about all you want, but then you get to really practice it when you're, when you're working with other people. And actually, a funny story I was remembering when we first started collaborating, was I didn't, I was like pretty anti-technology, uh, including, you know, computers and things, not that long ago, we'll say. Um, and so I made a, a fake, I made Photoshop, quote unquote, through drawings. So it was like, I was trying to express some ideas visually with Chip, but, but and I drew, I drew them, I drew his photos and I drew what my idea was, and I, and I cut them out, and so, and then I like pasted them around on the page to show potential. <laughs> and I feel like there was like a miscommunication about it in the beginning, like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, are you trying to take over this thing? Because we didn't know each other, like, really at all. Um, and I was like, no, 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 I just showed the Photoshop, and I don't know how it works. And then it was kind of this beautiful, actually, like, I feel like the friendship kind of grew out of the miscommunication turning into, like, a deeper understanding of, like, the heart that's behind it. And I think that that's, like, a really special, um, like that, then these processes of creating new worlds is messy, you know, and, and and this like and how cool is it? Like you know that someone's gonna like be your friend when you can like work through something, you know, and you can kind of get around like being like, oh okay, because the world is this way, but we don't have to be this way. And I think since then, I think we we communicate pretty well. <laughs> like, I think that that was like the first. One. So Thea and I have done several, I think, fascinating projects together, but it's been cool to get invited into spaces we might not otherwise be in. Uh, for example, um, she now has a really strong connection with a group of physicians based out of Harvard <laughs> um, who have a project called the Social, Social Medicine Con Consortium. And um, they invited me to create art for them, and I invited Thea to come in on the collaboration. Um, and as a consequence, she's been traveling with them to places like Haiti, where she's teaching printmaking. <laughs> um, and you want to talk? Yeah. 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 I mean, also, and then that's been a really that's been a really beautiful because they invited Chip because he's a physician, as many of you know, maybe from reading also. And so for them, this idea of, of an artist and a physician was so fascinating. And so him being in that space was just like, like it really exciting actually for them to be like, wow, I guess in some ways we're all artists, you know, but then how do we express it? How do we do, how do we live it? You know, and how do we live it while having like other kinds of, of 
of careers or jobs and how do we like put the two together. And so the, I mean, I think like doing the life self screening too made it kind of a connection that went even deeper of, of a lot of the physicians seeing possibilities that they wouldn't see. But it's so been really beautiful working with them um, because they, their heart is social justice, right? They do a lot of the same work actually that Just Seeds is doing, um, but, but through the lens of medicine and not through the lens of, of, of printmaking, you know? And, and it's just like, but it's so exciting because I feel like it's really new, the relationship. And so it's, it's kind of like, how do we integrate it? And I feel at some point, like I kind of get to have this like role of opening up a space for there to be like an even deeper connection. Like Chip's, Chip like opened the door and then I get to like open the like living space in it. And then like, I think more and more artists will be able to be, you know, working actually with physicians. And I think that that combination, because the idea I think that a lot of them expressed is that like, wow, if we don't treat, if we don't treat what's happening socially and, and to our land, like if we don't take care of the larger context, we're just gonna be sitting in a, in a room, like treating the same illness again and again and again for eternity. And I think like a lot of the physicians were like, wow, like I came into this because I wanna heal. You know, and I feel the same about like the, the lens through which I do artwork, that I came into it because I want, I want to heal through consciousness, you know? That we can like, that I think art has this capacity to push consciousness past where it is. And so, yeah, really exciting and yeah and I feel like with the border in Quintro the SOAW watch also the School of America's watch um, they invited Chip to, to do a piece and he and he invited me to collaborate on it as well and it's also a beautiful like not a, not a really strong integration of visual arts like music yes but the visual arts and not seeing like wow we're so visual actually in our in our way of kind of comprehending our worlds and right now advertising just has the, like advertising takes up almost all of people's visual space, you know? Like I would say the majority of people's visual kind of capacity for, for taking that information in is through advertising. And so this, you know, so I feel like that for them it opened up this like, wow, like we have to integrate the visual arts into this movement building um, in, a, in a way, in a way larger scope, you know? And I think it kind of became important so we, and it's been amazing to work with, with them as well. I think because the energy is there, you know, like and the, and the will and the, and the want and the desire and the kind of brilliant thinking that's in a systematic way. Yeah, I don't know that I have any, well actually I do have one thought. Um, as Thea alluded, I um, went to medical school, I'm a physician, and um, a lot of my training has emphasized the need to be essentially anal retentive and be very exact and precise. <laughs> um, and for 22 years, I worked out of my home dark room where I attempted to be exacting and precise in the same sort of way. And it's just been a really liberating experience for me to start working on the street and um, you know, still telling stories, still um, working in a documentary sense, but put, make, making the images big and telling stories in that way, but then interacting with people from the community as I'm putting the piece up or once it's been up. Um, and then accepting that <laughs> because the work is on the street, as Jesse alluded, you know, you don't know the life of it. Um, it may not only disappear, but I mean, someone may tag part of it, you know, and it's altered. And there's a lot to be said for just letting go, as you talked about. Um, and then the other thing about collaborating for me is, it's just as you were saying, you know, but I, in my case, I just really feel that it's an opportunity to, to learn, to listen, to grow, to see things in a different way. Um, and not necessarily, you know, be in a space where I'm alone, like in my dark room, um, looking for the uh, perfect, exact, um, exactly executed image. So, yeah. I was just thinking about um, collaboration can be a way to force intersectionality into spaces. Um, because that's like been a goal of mine as like as a white person that gets a platform. Like if I get a platform, I need to bring other voices that aren't that are underrepresented. And I think that's a very important thing that collaboration can do. And I just 
throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyone have any questions about um, anything we've talked about, any of the images in the show? Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm really interested in the. I'm very interested in the um, confluence, for lack of a better word, of medicine and art, because I've worked in hospitals in my life, and they they did some really interesting collaborations uh, with all the staff and physicians who were artists. Yeah. And they, so, you know, it's not as rare as people think it is, oh. but I'm wondering, you know, if you could talk a little bit about how it affects your work, being a, being a physician. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so did, did everyone got the question? Yeah. Yep. So, um, well, they're both arts, and um, one is a healing art, the other one is um, a visual art, but my visual art now has a social practice. So it's been an, a fascinating experience for me on a number, number of different levels, because I didn't start working public, publicly in, in, the community, in the community until I'd been there for 22 years. Um, and, you know, so people didn't necessarily know that I'm an artist, and um, even though I would, you know, sometimes go out into the community with my camera and spend lots of time with people photographing. And a lot of times people just never saw the work. And people knew me or know me as Dr. Thomas. And um, whenever they come to the clinic, generally they're in a position of wanting something addressed. <laughs> Such that the power dynamic is one where I'm on top. And... Um, in doing work in the community, working publicly, I really feel that the um, power dynamic is flipped because then I become kind of a random black man working on the side. Uh, <laughs> there's a story I just thought of. Um, I started doing the wheat pasting project in 2009. In 2010, I was going to um, wheat paste a rodeo announcer stand yeah, for the Western Agency or Tuba City Fair on the reservation. And uh, the fair was to start, the parade and the fair were to start on a Saturday. So on Friday night, I drove an hour from my house to the rodeo stand and started working after work, pasting. And I saw two outhouses off on the side and thought it would be nice to paste them as well, but I didn't have the pictures with me. So I woke up early the next morning around four um, drove through darkness, got to the site, it was still dark, and I started using my headlights to put these pictures on the, um, on the outhouses. And um, as I was doing it, I noticed that someone who was in an 18-wheeler truck, apparently he was um, in some way involved with the radio, but he was sleeping in the cab of his truck. Um, and it was still dark, and I was there putting paste and pictures on these outhouses using my headlights. And so I was an older white guy who was who needed to use the toilet. <laughs> so he walked into the toilet and then um, came out and looked at me and asked, "You know, where else would you find a black man on an Indian reservation at a rodeo event at sunrise, wallpapering the outside of an of an, of an outhouse?" So, in doing that work, I feel somewhat vulnerable, and it flips the uh, power dynamic, you know, such that I'm, I'm no longer on top, but it's, it's just been really wonderful to um, interact with the community from my passion, as opposed to solely from my pro profession. And the other thing I think about frequently is, um, when I see patients in the clinic, you know, I'm attempting to help people live their best lives and to realize their dreams and to create an environment of wellness within the individual. But in a very intentional way with the pictures I put up that attempt to reflect beauty back to the community, um, I'm attempting to create an environment of wellness in the larger community. So I see those two practices as being complementary. Yeah. Yeah. 
I am curious how you ended up working and living there, and if you will see yourself continuing to live there for a long, long time, and if um, with your show and your statement about corn and diabetes, if there is any kind of movement on that reservation for more indigenous foods to try to heal people and steer them away from the crap USA sad diet. Yeah, so I gave the microphone to my friend Peggy, who is responsible for me starting to work out on the reservation. I can't tell you how. <laughs> this is the short part of the story, because the real story he, he can tell because it's what happened after he got there. But So I'm also a physician, and when I finished medical, Chip and I were really close friends in medical school. And when I finished my uh, residency training in family medicine, Chip also trained in family medicine, um, my husband and I went to the reservation to pay back Uncle Sam, quite honestly, uh, for putting us through sc for medical school. And um, after our first year there, we needed more help. So I called my friend Chip and said, please come, you will Actually, love this. So it's, it's, a, it's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I remember. Uh, <laughs> So what happened in my case was the government paid my, my education for four years. I had to pay the government back for four years. And the government assigned me to the state of Mississippi. And I, um, do, I did a lot of cycling at the time and had been in West Virginia doing my residency and had an unfortunate racial incident cycling and didn't want to be in Mississippi cycling. So I told this story to Peggy and she said, she had told her husband at the time that she thought that place would really resonate with me. And that was almost 32 years ago. Um, but yeah, so I went out there because I had a four-year obligation um, to pay Uncle Sam back and just really fell in love with the place and the people and the experience. So, yeah. Um, and with, with so. The, the, I don't know if people have spent any time on the Navajo Nation, but it's 27,500 square miles in size, larger than the state of West Virginia, larger than 10 in individual states within the U.S. Um, it's home to 180, 175, 180,000 people. Um, and presently there are 12 supermarkets on the reservation. Yet the reservation has, um, during the 90s anyway, I don't know about the aughts, had the highest per capita um, the highest per capita sales of soft drinks, um, the highest per capita sales of spam, <coughs> and there was a KFC franchise on the eastern part of the reservation near Gallup and Winter Rock that had the highest per capita or the highest sales per yeah per capita. Um, so the reservation is very much a food desert. Or is it food island? Food, food, desert. food desert, yeah. Desert. Um, <coughs> that, that would be nice. Too. Um, and uh, there are, you know, within, there's a movement afoot for people to return to more tra traditional farming techniques because with the present diet, um, some diseases like diabetes, are, the, the rates are the highest in the, in the country. Uh, but oh, and the Navajo Nation actually was one of the few pl was the first place in the country, <coughs> excuse me, that passed a, a, an ordinance um, across the reservation to um, not tax healthy food, but to tax junk food on the reservation. It was originally called the Twinkie Death Tax, um, <laughs> but <laughs> the final ordinance had his name changed. Um, so there, there are movements of foot for food autonomy, but yeah, it's slow coming. I just want to share a story of your first guerrilla artwork on the res. <coughs> so when you would, when you would, so we were in Arizona, and when you were off the res, but as soon as you would come on to the reservation land, there was this huge billboard that said, "You're entering Pepsi Company, Cut Country." You're entering Pepsi country. And Chip and a couple of the other nurses, one, went other out, nurse. one other nurse went out one night 
and changed it and said, you're entering diabetes country. Wow. And so, just remember that was your first yeah, thank gorilla you for that. art yeah, project. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was an effort actually to challenge the Pepsi Corporation to think about where they're advertising, you know, these sugary drinks. It, it is a population with the highest incidence of diabetes. One out of four um, amongst whites is roughly one out of 12. Amongst uh, African Americans is about one out of five or so. Um, but uh, it was also an opportunity to ask the people on the reservation to think about the relationship between their um, diet and their, and their health. And it ran for about a month. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm curious, if, well, let's go that one. Corn is obviously very important. I'm sorry, what's the corn, corn is corn. obviously very yeah. important to uh, the indigenous uh, Native Americans and, and on this reservation. I assume that's where this photograph is from, but also it seems that it's become important to you. So, since I've been looking at this corn stalk this whole time, and it's your art, I'd like to steer this a little bit to your art here. You don't have to give any in-depth explanation at all. But just about corn, if you're in an introspective mood and you look at a stalk of corn, or a, many stalks of corn, what are associations or thoughts or feelings or symbolisms or connections to your life now? Come to you. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> that's a question. Give me a moment. <laughs> um, I can say just superficially, um, it's very easy to photograph corn just because it's, um, as you noted, it's important for the population. It's one of the traditional foods, uh, the three sisters, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and um, as with sheep and goats on the reservation, um, with the corn plant, people use every part of it. You know, there are prayers that are done with the pollen, and um, all sorts of foods are cre created with it. Um, so as I look at corn, I, as I wrote in my mission statement, actually see it as an opportunity to um, look at something we share with, um, you know, I mean, what is it that bonds us? What is it that's considered a commonality, um, say, across the Americas, uh, or even within the US alone? Um, and that particular food is one of the things that binds us, yet it has this really unfortunate history. I mean, I have to think about that too. Again, I'm in a community where people, one out of four individuals, not just has diabetes, but is living with the consequences of that devastating illness with renal disease, blindness, heart attacks, amputations. And knowing that corn syrup is in everything that we consume and is contributing you know, to these poor health stats and outcomes, um, so I, it's funny, when I look at corn, I think of George Washington Carver. And I think of him because it's a plant that has many utilities, you know, it's a biofuel, which is really beautiful. Um, and it's just um, something that's here that we are still learning about. And, uh, yeah, any? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, think, I mean, corn also has this really, I mean, humans themselves, you know, was a grain that was really small, and it was through, you know, it was, it was through, um, what is the word? I can't, not in the right language. Um, but it was manipulated by humans to, you know, to be something that was really, like, edible and nourish, nourishing across the Americas. Across pollination. It was domesticated, yeah. And so I think of it, and, and there, there's so many creation stories connected to it, and so I really think that there's this really beautiful kind of, there is there is humanity, you know, and, and population growth and all these things actually do have a direct connection to corn um, being, you know, a domesticated food that allowed for greater populations. And I, and I think that, that that connection also is really, you know, incredible. And then, so, and then you know, the idea of the kernels on the husk. <laughs> there's, like, there's all these like, metaphors, right? <laughs> I, was, I was just thinking about going back to collaboration and this image, the, the border wall, like, so corn is like, 
I don't know. It makes me think about um, trade routes and like trade and indigenous trade routes and a wall that is in <laughs> blocking indigenous trade routes on land that we are claiming as our own, which is not our own. And um, I don't know, that's where I go with corn. I go automatically to trade routes of indigenous folks that are here and that are displaced and are continuing, they're continued to be displaced. And um, currently there's thousands of children that have been taken away from their parents. Like, I, that's what it generates for me, <laughs> you know. And I heard um, from a, one of the gallery guests last night, he was saying that um, we've been exporting corn now through new trade with Central America, and that's creating um, farmers losing their work in Honduras and countries like that, and so that's making it so they don't have work and they have to go elsewhere to look for work, so that's creating. Our exporting of corn is bringing um, pretty much people that have lost jobs because of that back to, to us. And so yeah, there you go. I mean, yeah, that wall was created because of NAFTA in 94, and really, yeah. I mean, the, the, the history of that, if you guys don't know it already, also worth looking into. But a lot of these problems are similar because of, the, because of NAFTA. I was just going to um, also say that, you know, the quote above this particular photograph, I think, speaks to our relationship with corn, not just with corn, but with the earth. Um, so it's, corn is a, um, an opportunity, working with corn is an opportunity to reconnect with the earth and to understand power in a different way. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts you want to share? Um, we'll have to listen. <clears throat> I have to admit, I've really not given a lot of deep thought to it, except for the, what, you, what is it called, the three sisters, that yeah. relationship. I thought about that as being so powerful and it, it being the basis of uh, so many human beings living in North uh, and Central America, at least for a long time. So I thought about that, but I've, I've never really thought about any other aspect of corn other than, you know, kind of eating it and it's pretty and, you know, it, it, the beauty of aspects of it and, but when I was thinking about the collaboration, I suppose when you see a field of corn, you know, they all kind of help protect each other and maybe I'm reaching, but I can kind of think of it like that as well, as well as a single stock by itself has a pretty tough time, but when there's a bunch of them, they can understand the elements. So that comes to my mind. Uh, I better stop there before I make a fool of myself. Thank you. Thanks for returning that question. <laughs> okay. Um. I think you could get really meta because as in corn itself is a collaborator. You're talking about collaboration, right? And it's the perfect combination, the bean and the corn and the, what's the squash growing together. Yeah. I think it's in the very back. Yeah. Hey guys. Hi. One other really cool thing about corn is that it needs to be pollinated by um, other plants. And so like one corn stalk on its own won't produce the ear of corn, just for people who don't know that. But anyways, so, um, I, so we're talking about kind of like the history of corn and like ancient relationships. And we're also talking about like really sad, kind of like Western, modern, like industrial corn syrup. Um, and so I'm wondering, but then this image behind us is like so beautiful and full of hope. Um, and so I'm wondering, Chip, if you, through your experience, if you have any stories you want to tell about like your relationship to corn on the reservation or like other stories that you feel comfortable sharing about like people tending corn um, or like, like kind of current day relationships that are healthy with corn. Thanks. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so, actually, when, it's unfortunate Ryan isn't here because he's part Hopi, I think, and uh, this particular
particular girl is named Metzli. She lives with her family on Second Mesa. Uh, the Hopi Reservation is loca located within the confines of the Navajo Nation. And the Hopi are known for um, a style of farming called dry farming, where they uh, plant the seeds relatively deeply in the soil. And um, they don't necessarily get a lot of rain on a consistent basis. It does happen during the rainy season in the summer, but um, yeah, so this particular style of farming is dry farming. And this particular field actually, I think it's her great grandfather's field that had gone fallow for a number of years, but her mother and father have a permaculture institute on Second Mesa where they do uh, uh, cob building, um, straw bale building, and they uh, do farming. They're also doing a farming project with the look with one of the, the local schools in their village where they have uh, fruit trees and uh, some vegetables growing and they're getting the students involved in uh, in that in that process um, I don't really have corn related stories um, I have stories that are corny <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> yeah. No pollen for it. <laughs> uh, corn pollen. That's actually a good question. I don't. So my friend Peggy asked if I have any corn pollen related stories. Um, you know. So okay, I'm going to answer this in a somewhat obscure way. Um, in that, I have been on the reservation for 32 years, and I'm here because of the work that I've done um, in the community putting art on buildings um, on the reservation. And, you know, one has to ask, um, is, am I being appropriative in that practice? Um, and it's something I struggled with. Um, but, uh, so even though I have a relationship with corn pollen, which traditionally is used for prayer on the reservation, I'm not altogether comfortable talking about it because it's not my, um, I mean, I, I think clearly there, uh, I am being appropriative. <laughs> um, but I think using it as it's used on the reservation for me anyway is less appropriate. But um, I do recognize it as, um, as a medicine, and um, yeah, something that's used in a spirit, spiritual way. So, yeah. Thanks for allowing me a second question. I want to follow up about the soda pop uh, issue, because I've heard that uh, problem more than an issue, serious issue, um, that there's not adequate drinking water on the Navajo in the Navajo Nation, there's a real problem with them getting water that they can drink. Yeah. So is this why they're drinking all the soda pop? Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it varies from community to community. I was going to say that even these fills um, have become less pro productive over the years because there's a um, a coal mining operation very close close by the, the Peabody Kayenta mine um, has tapped into the aquifer um, up on the mesa and I don't think it's depleted but a lot of the springs that used to, to run and feed these fills um, underground have dried up um, so it really depends on where you are around the reservation. One of the things that I point out, I, I actually do a talk about my art practice and I tell people, um, we went through the size of the res, the population, and I'll say there are four natural, there are five natural resources on the reservation that are being exploited. Four of them are being exploited for energy. <clears throat> what are they? I, that's that's not a rhetorical question. I'm <laughs> uranium. Uranium. Oh, gas. Gas. Natural gas. Coal. Coal. <laughs> Water. Water in, in aquifers. And I think okay. I have to. I do. I have a sequence. I, I think the one that we left out is natural gas. So there's natural gas, coal, oil, uranium, and water in, in aquifers. Yet. 
Um, I said there were roughly 180,000 people on the reservation. In the area where I live and work, 20% of people still don't have running water or electricity. Um, yet, <laughs> coal, oil, natural gas, uranium, and water are being exploited from the uh, reservation. So, um, pop is cheap. It is now being taxed because of the Twinkie death tax. So it's a little bit more expensive, but people still buy it in large quantities. And you know, I mean, I think part of it too is wanting to live a modern lifestyle. You know. Um, I remember I was talking with an artist in Brazil in 2009, just before I started doing my wheat pasting project, and he would frequently paint um, kids, street kids, and he would paint them on the street. And he would frequently paint uh, an image of a street kid with angel wings who was eating like McDonald's fries. And he asked, and that's because he had talked with one of the kids and said, you know, if you get a million hay ice, um, or Brazilian dollars, what would you do with it? And he said, I would go to McDonald's like the rich kids, and, you know. And I think there's an element of that, you know, um, on the reservation where people are taken in by the advertising. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, 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 that corn, corn syrup, there. <laughs> there we go, yeah. So I'm curious to hear uh, from you what your perception is of how the people in the community feel about it. You said you, you were doing all this work which they didn't see and then suddenly they were all popping up on the sides of these buildings and what, so how did they feel about that? That's a great question and it's been a process. And part of the process is, you know, there's a history of indigenous folks not necessarily feeling comfortable with being photographed. Um, they're um, on the reservation. I don't know the best way to state this, but a lot of times people don't want to show off. You know, they um, tend to be very private, very personal, um, and there's not um, a plethora of I forget what the money is called, the extra money that people get to spend. Um, income. What? Disposable income. Disposable income. Yeah. There's. <laughs> thank you. Um, so there's not a tradition, uh, there's a tradition of art, um, certainly um, the ancestral Puebloan people have, you know, drawings in some of the nearby um, dwellings in the canyons, um, but in terms of muralism, there's not a tradition of that, you know, and suddenly uh, pictures would pop up. Um, literally, black and white photographs of people from the community were just suddenly starting to appear around the reservation. And so there's a thing on the reservation where um, if people don't know what something's about, they think they, they are being witched, and that thing becomes evil. <laughs> um, so, but that, when I talk about this, I usually say there's three religions on the reservation. There's Christianity, there's the Native American church, and the tra traditional people. And within those three groups, there are mores and values by which people live. And, you know, there are older people and younger people. So younger people with, who have been off the reservation more, who know public art, street art, liked the pieces originally. Um, older, more tra traditional people didn't know why or what. So when I started my practice, it was very much about me. <laughs> um, I had spent three months in Brazil on sabbatical, was hanging out with people who were making art. This was 2009. It was before Exit Through the Gift Shop came out. And I thought the way you do street art is by sneaking around at night. <laughs> and uh, uh, I had an experience once where I put I, I, and I thought I would try to be fair and put imagery from each religion out in the community so people didn't feel I was being biased. And one of the images that I put out was I had a friend who was learning to be a road man in the Native American church, and he had buttons of peyote that he had picked in Texas, and he was showing them to me, and I took a photograph of his hand, and I made a mandala where I put his hand in three different places, and I put that on a, on a roadside stand late one night. And uh, it was about 12 miles from my house. The next day I was driving in the Flagstaff, and I noticed that the piece was starting to come off. 
And so I thought, okay, when I come back, um, flag is two hours away. When I come back to the res, I will go out and tack that piece down. So the next day I went to tack it down and it had been scraped off the building. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I'll just replace the entire piece. I went back two days later, the building was gone. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out that particular person um, is a pretty hardcore Christian, has no tolerance for the Native American church, and I wasn't engaged in the community, you know, in the process at this point because I was doing what I thought street artists did, but that all changed when uh, one day while going into Flagstaff, I noticed a roadside stand that was falling down, but it had a beautiful weathered maroon wall, and I thought a black and white image would look amazing against that wall. And I thought, well, I'm gonna go with something safe. What would be safe? An image of corn, <laughs> an image of sheep, or an image of the code talkers. And um, I put an image of the code talkers on this building, and I thought it looked great. Um, and then a week later, when I was going in the Flagstaff, I saw four guys out working on this building. I didn't know what was going on. So I pulled over and said, hey, can I take a picture of the coat talkers? And they said, yeah, you may as well, because everyone else has been stopping to take a picture. And I asked what they were doing, and they said, well, so many people had stopped to take the picture that they decided to start using the roadside stand again. So I let them know I put the picture up and they thanked me and said can you put something on the other side to stop traffic coming from Flagstaff <laughs> so it was it was at that point I realized okay I need to approach this differently <laughs> I need to start talking to people and letting them see how they might benefit. so anyway things have evolved over the past nine years where I get a lot of love from people on the reservation and it's really a conversation the work is a conversation with people on the reservation. I'm aware that there are tourists from all over the world passing through the res. I live between Monument Valley, the Grand Canyon, Lake Powell, Canyon de Chez. So it's a super beautiful area. Um, but I really, again, want people on the res to see these beautiful images of themselves. Um, this is an area where the teen suicide rate is two to three times the national average, you know, where the unemployment rate is over 50%. Um, so, yeah, that's the nature of that conversation. It's cool because people get that I'm coming to them from a place of love, and that has implications for how they see me as a provider in the community because now they know that I'm not just committed to... I, I'm there because I very much want to be there, and... Um, yeah, I mean, I bring that same energy, that same attitude, that same love into the uh, interaction with the patients. So, yeah. Hang on. Hi. Okay, so I have a question for all three of you, and um, thanks, Chip. You kind of explained a little bit about, like, artist social practice, or you mentioned earlier the artist social practice, and so for us, like, lay people who don't know what social practice is, um, I'm wondering if you two can maybe talk, or maybe Chip, you can elaborate, but also I know y'all are involved in the community. Kind of explain like what, maybe tell some stories about um, examples of your art and being involved in, commu in a community process and what, what that's like and what's the benefit of that. Thanks. <laughs> Social practice. So uh, my my work is it, it's gone involved into a bunch of different walks, but I, I started getting tattooed as protest. Um, mainly, well, it started with getting protest about the prison industrial complex and how racist and corrupt it is. So I started getting everything from the neck up tattooed in protest of our prison system and. Um, and then I also started protesting police violence against mainly black people. And I got like, don't shoot tattooed on my palms. And so I'm, as far as like all my work, even like my initial graffiti work was all done in protest. I, I used to think that graffiti itself was um, 
an act of protest because it was civil disobedience. But I have a big, I don't know, I kind of have a re uh, realization that, that Chip kind of had, but mine was different about who, whose building and whose property I was um, vandalizing. Because I, I was a straight, like, hardcore vandal. And, um, but that changed as I got older because I realized, like, I can't just tag on my neighbor's property because <laughs> my neighbor is not the man, you know? And, um, and so, but I also, I work with homeless youth in, in Portland and um, I work with an organization called Don't Shoot Portland, which is a branch of Black Lives Matter. Um, and so I, I do volunteer work, I do everything, I do, and I put my energy towards is social justice, and so that's that's my interaction with social justice. Um, yeah, I've, for me, it's it's. I think living in Mexico actually for a lot of years really um, integrated, really like aspects and kind of a deeper understanding of the potential of visual arts of printmaking in particular um, to, to shift and move uh, consciousness and to be an aspect, a building block of, of, social, of um, social movements. Um, and, I, and I understood something quite, quite beautiful as well is that, that it's, the, it's the little acts and those little acts are, are about connection with people, you know, with your people and building out from there. And that, when I first was there, I was like self screening all these t-shirts and I just was like, why did, like, how does this, how could this matter? I just was like really in one of those places of, of doubt of just being like, this is like the world is like in total crisis. It's falling apart. Like we're all going to die any moment. Like I was in one of those <laughs> places that's easy to go to. And I just was like, like, this is like the stu like I just like crossed, like Mexico City is massive. I lived in the state of Mexico. It was like three and a half hour bus ride. And I'm mean, just like, you know, there was like 10 of us to silk screen like 10 t-shirts. <laughs> we needed one person who could do it. And it was a real like US mentality too of like, well, I, there's a job to do and I'm gonna do it. And, uh, and then, and so I just was like, and, and, that, and then all of a sudden I just was like, relax. Like actually, he, like we're doing this thing together and, and in doing it, like we're having these conversations. Like all of a sudden I was learning about stuff that was happening all over the world because these 10 people were brilliant and had a lot of life experience. They were older than me, they were younger than me. They had like, lived radically different lives than me. And I just like listened and I was like, Oh, and then we went out to the this like massive protest against Coca-Cola buying the water rights to all of Mexico. They were trying, um, you know, no bold moves. <laughs> um, and so there was just like millions of people, right? And we were and we were just out there, you know, with our little like DIY like punk collective, and 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 we were there, and then we were having conversations, and I met all of these people. That then some of the people from that first time, which is like so cool how life works in the end actually ended up giving us a building where we had a social center years later. So it all like did actually from that moment of like deep doubt kind of make this other um, connection to like, and I'm like, it's the little things, it's not the, it's not the big things, but it's the little things that are connected. Um, which I think is kind of at the basis of this idea of social practice, but it can happen quite naturally. It doesn't have to happen. Well, it's social practice. I mean, <laughs> No, not like a dictionary. <laughs> you can live it. I want you all to define it. Define it by living it. <laughs> which, which means like consciously, consciously creating, you know, like in community, you know? I think, and I think it is the idea of autonomy and, in, and interdependence, you know? Like really being like, oh yeah, if I'm my best self, if I'm my very best self, my most unique best self, I can show up in groups and do work in groups in a far more powerful way than if, I'm just always pretending to be something I'm not to assimilate and fit into a group. And I think it's something we've been taught, like that unlearning to learn again, I think it's a, like some radical shift of thought that can potentially really, really change all of our interactions, you know? But I think it's gonna happen from the genius that comes from people being willing to show up as their, as their full self, you know? So. 
Yeah, so um, as I understand social practice, it involves, and I don't know that there's, I, apparently there are genre within the field of social practice. Um, I know Alex is an artist who, are you, do you want to give a definition? No? <laughs> um, but it, it, part of the interaction with the community, as I understand it, is a longitudinal um, interaction with people over time. So it becomes like, um, um, well, a co collaboration with the community. So for example, one of the things I've done um, is I get artists out to the reservation and as often as possible, I attempt to, to get them to go into schools. We don't really have a lot of community centers where the youth get together in, in my neighborhood, but um, to go do workshops over anywhere maybe up to three weeks um, with students and teach various art skills and to make things to beautify their communities. Um, so that's one way my social practice is attempting to integrate and interact with the community. Uh, there's going to be a project that I'll do with an isolated community out on the rest. I'm bringing uh, two folks in who are going to work with the community over the course of a year. So. Yeah. yeah. Where are we? Where, yeah, so where is Ryan? Right. <laughs> well, Ryan uh, needs the assistance of Mr. Jesse okay. to finish up, so this might be a good point for either one more question or a transition moment. Um, okay. You guys want to keep talking? Oh, but let, we need to make room for Ryan. Yeah, we gotta, we gotta pick up the chairs. Okay. We can have a tiny house. We can have a more informal kind of, kind of circle. We can create our social practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. We can practice practicing. <laughs>
Yeah, so that um, that came the idea as far 